Oh, there we go. Um, I want to talk about modeling a prototype and in different ways. Um, maybe you'll get some inspiration. Jack, uh, you need to hit OK to clear that thing so we can see what's going on on your screen. Uh, I'm sharing. And I hit the OK. So are people seeing a picture of my layout? Yes. Looks good. OK. Um, so maybe get, provide some, some I'm ideas. I'm sorry, that was me. Oh. Um, I want to share some stories, uh, maybe inspire you to do a little bit more um, and some ideas and so forth. Uh, I model Yosemite Valley Railroad, circa, circa August 1939. This is what you see when you walk into the layout room, which in California, other houses, they're called a, bay, or a garage, two-car garage. Um, I live in, in the Bay Area. Our house is about 30 feet above sea level currently. And um, there's nobody in this whole town that has a basement. I've saw part of one once, but, um, and we don't have attics. You know, we have space up there, but nothing, no room to store things. And so uh, layouts are built in garages right here, unless you have a really big house and so forth. So layout is done, finished it in 2011. This is looking uh, at the rest of the layout from what the first photo was. Um, layout is essentially four levels in places. Right here, if you can see my, I assume you're showing my cursor, there's a level there which goes to a um, hidden reverse loop. Then you can see another level above that. You can see the level where the log train is you can see an incline, and that goes up to an area that you can only see on a step stool. Um, most of it is two levels. The functional area is two levels. Which I model YV, this is a January 1939 public timetable. Um, looking at the map, uh, you can see Oakland and San Francisco on the, the left. Um, we live about um, 20 minutes from Oakland. In those days during the summer, and this is very strange because this is a, a real timetable. It's not a reproduction, but they have taped this. You can see kind of a little bit different color. That was actually glued onto the sheet and it's a multi-level or multi-page thing. But you could take the, say on a weekend, you could take the ferry across from San Francisco to Oakland, get on a Pullman, go to sleep, wake up the next morning, well, in your Pullman, um, you'd be into Merced at around 5, 530, uh, have breakfast on the diner, get you up to El Pertel, and a bus would take you into the valley. Uh, spend Saturday and Sunday touring the Yosemite Valley, get on your train, and you'd be back to San Francisco Monday morning in time to go to work. So this is a close-up of that map um, showing the various locations along the railroad. The railroad was 77 miles long. Let's start with freight cars. This is a uh, Excel spreadsheet I built um, many years ago. When I was researching my book, which should be um, 2005 or so, uh, I had access to a bunch of stuff that a rail fan named Al Rose had collected. He was a uh, lithographer. What he did is he made book paste ups where you would print 16 pages um, and he would take a photo and put them together so they could be printed into books. Uh, he was a rail fan. The YV was his favorite railroad. When the railroad was being scrapped, the scrapper was obviously a cheapskate went to and thought he was going to sell everything, uh, all the locomotives, all the freight cars, everything. Uh, went to a, probably a local photographer, asked how much it would cost to get prints of the locomotives. Thought that was way too expensive. Someone said, well, you ought to talk, talk to Al Rose, see what he can do. So Al Rose, uh, maybe 20 miles away or 30 miles away, pretty close. Uh, went inside and said, tell you what, I'll give you all the photos you want for free if everything you're going to throw out of the station, 
you put it in a pile. I come every Sunday, Saturday and pick it up. And so he had a lot of these files. I was working on my book after he passed away. And his uh, widow asked me if I was going to do a book on the railroad. So this was from some papers that he collected. And you can see this is empty cars on hand on specific dates. This is 1936 through 37. Uh, you'll notice there's Santa Fe, GN, SP, UP, WP, so forth. And that was kind of an eye opener to me. Uh, I should have realized it, that you're not going to load foreign cars on the YV. Um, there were shippers that shipped stuff off of the YV uh, and SP was the main pa partner. The YV connected with both the Santa Fe and the SP. Uh, if the YV needed six boxcars, empty boxcars. The SP supplied them. Therefore, the SP got the money for shipping them around the country. So you also noted that most of these empty cars are from Western railroads. And um, so I started building resin kits about 25 years later, or in the 80s. And it was about 25 years later that I found that list of cars that, that were on hand. So I started selling resin kits. The Erie, the, the Erie would not have a car on the YV. Freight growers, no, because all the freight, all the refrigerator teams cars came from PFE, which was a partner in the Santa Fe, or some with from the Santa Fe. Milwaukee, the SP B50-15 would be appropriate, but it wasn't built until after 1939. Um, so forth. And I also started selling cars that I'd already built. The one in the upper left, wrong lettering, that was a, um, a car that I'd built. And I mentioned um, Richard Hendrickson earlier. He was an expert on freight cars. He did a lot of articles on freight cars. Um, he came to visit my layout, looked for, didn't say a thing, looked around and everything, probably spent an hour or two went home and wrote me a letter and told me, Jack, that Seaborn car, that lettering wasn't there until 1953. So I had to sell it. Uh, the next two were too new. The, there was one of these uh, middle cars, Baltimore and Ohio, that looked like that, but it was an earlier one. This one didn't come out till after 39. Uh, the Rutland is too far from home. NYC, too far from home. The UTL extinct cars were correct, but I bought six of them and I didn't need six of them. So I sold three of those. Um, and then again, this, the reefer was wrong. Some of them seemed correct. Um, I bought, I found this photo. Uh, right now I've got about 3,800 photos of the YV. I don't know when it was I bought, got this one. But um, there are a couple gondolas. So therefore, I can have gondolas. Well, when I was writing my book, I did some more research, found out that these gondolas were there in 1945 to service a mine that was, um, I don't remember what now, what, what they were digging out of there. But it was hauled out by truck. They used a, a truck dump and dumped in these cars. So they weren't there till 45. They were sold on eBay. Well, this is the uh, resin kit that I'm building now is a Pacific electric car. Now, I would not think that that would be appropriate on my railroad, even though Pacific Electric was owned by Southern Pacific. But this is a screen grab from a movie shot in 1939. And the guy is unloading cases of beer from this PE car. So I'm building this car right now. So right now I've got, um, about 30 or so foreign freight cars on the layout. I don't need a whole lot more. Um, operations are limited to a, four trains. One train is a log train, takes empties up, bring loaded log cars back. One does the same thing with um, some hopper cars that I'll to show you later. And then the other two are just general freight. And each of those has maybe five or six cars in it. 
so I don't need a lot of cars. But um, I've got 40 more resin kits that I will probably start selling off because I'm not, I know I'm, I'm too old to get 40 more kits built. Now, this is one car that is on the layout. Uh, rarely can you find a photo of an actual car on the railroad that you're modeling at a location you're modeling. And the photo was taken in 1939, the year that I modeled. From this, I was able to figure out that it was a P or Pacific, a Pacific, a uh, Pennsylvania railroad car and the type of car. And so I built this one. Um, and then I did an article for the Historical Society for the Pennsylvania Railroad um, because I got in touch with somebody there and they told me where to find photos and lettering and so forth. So it is shown at the same spot that it shown in that um, the previous slide. And what they are bringing on board is wire rope. There were two, two logging inclines on this railroad. Uh, one was built in 1913 and shut down in 1921 or 22. Next one was built in 1923 at a different location. Each is about 8,000 feet long. They went straight up the mountain and uh, brought loaded log cars down. They changed out the wire rope um, initially every 12 months and later about every 18 months. So that's what's happening here. They're, they will take this, unload it, and uh, use it to replace the cable on the, the, log, the logging incline. So some of the cars that I do have, uh, here's a log car at the same, same location, incline. My model of one. Well, let me back up on that one. Um, there's a guy that he's, he sold his business, but um, his name was Eric. Hmm. Can't remember his last name right now. But he mainly sold narrow gauge stuff and Denver rear grand type narrow gauge stuff. But he came over, he saw my lights a few times, um, saw my roundhouse that I had a bunch of scratch built tools in it. He came out with some uh, detail parts to make those types of equipment. Uh, saw one of my log cars, came out with a kit for it, and, um, and did the same thing for a stock car. So I bought, uh, I don't know, maybe 25 of these kits. And I was happy with them, but there were a couple of problems that I didn't like. One was the, um, the ends down here was a single casting, a metal casting. And on the prototype, it was metal frame with wood, Two, two layers of wood, uh, probably four inches thick or three inches at least. One level or vertical and the next one on the other side of it, horizontal. And with one that casting, there's no way you could replicate that very well. So I did 3D prints for the insill down here and the log bunk up here. Um, so I sold the 12 or, tw 12 or so built up kits I had and uh, put these together. So here's a train coming into the same station, ironically. Uh, it's got a bunch of empty log cars at the back. You'll see a UTLX tank car next to it. Um, that was the primary tank cars used on the railroad. They had a restriction, no cars over 8,500 gallons beyond um, milepost 34 which was out in the, the flatlands, the rest of the railroad was going up this canyon, as you can see, and uh, they didn't want to have a wreck and have gasoline or whatever um, spilling into the river. So these are little 6,000 gallon bend type tank cars. Um, I mentioned I sold three of them. I've got three of them on the layout. So here's a typical log train. These are empty cars up next to the engine. Uh, and a bunch of loaded log cars. They had 125 of these guys that I built uh, 14 so far, which is all I can use. Now they had a 51 of these cars. Uh, Westerville came out with a kit for them after I uh, told him about them. He came out with a kit for the same style car, but it was longer. And so I wrote to him and 
asked him if he would do these 22 foot long cars. These are X, um, I don't know, somewhere over back east that was using them uh, for hauling ore. And so I told him that if he was going to do them, I could provide plans and I could also take detail photos because the YV ones were gone, but the Sierra Railroad had some of the exact same cars bought from, used from the same uh, person or company. And they had some on display along the highway going up to um, one of their locations. So I went up and I was taking photos and thinking if I were building scratch building this, what photos would I want? I wouldn't want to see in the end and I want to see looking down into it, you know, so forth. So um, Al came out with the kits. I bought 51 of them, done 11 of them so far. Uh, they are a difficult kit, um, especially if you don't have a electric drill press. There are a lot of holes to drill. So there's some of my models of them, empty cars. They're going up to incline, which is just out of, just in the right-hand view. I'll show you pictures of that later. I also had some flat cars and should mention at this point, I built all the log cars I need, all the rock cars I need, all the flat cars, all the stock cars, all the box cars, all the maintenance away cars. Um, I have all the engines. I built all the cabooses. Uh, I have four passenger cars to do and then I will be done. There won't be anything else to model for 1939. But I've also detailed an engine that I had a brass model of and detailed it as it was in the 20s. It's never been on the layout, doesn't have a motor in it. Um, I detailed another locomotive that was semi-scrapped and not being used and it's on the layout, no motor, so forth. Uh, and then I built three of the early cabooses. So as you can tell, I like, I like scratch building stuff. So here's one of those cars. Here's the model of it, scratch built. Another one. They also had six heart and ballast cars. And these are the only two photos I have of it. You, it's in front of this 304, you can see this Dallas car, the inset is a color photo of a, 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 lo a locomotive. And that at least gave me the colors of it because that's the Dallas cars behind that. So the Chicago Northwestern Historical Society had original plans for it. I found that out by asking a question online because I didn't know what they had. I got the cars from them. That let me take those and make drawings and I'd already talked to um, Proto West Models about coming out with a resin kit for it, which they did in 2011. They are the ones that bought Grantline and they now sell all of what was Grantline parts, a lot of which are narrow gauge. And they really deal mostly in narrow gauge. So I've got all six of those cars. Track plans. So this is looking at the main yards in Merced, the tracks coming at you and then go, disappearing down in the left bottom corner are headed to the uh, SP interchange about a half a mile away. Um, looking straight back, you can see a, a, um, a building interlocking plant. That's where they crossed the Santa Fe. And just beyond that, they had a interchange with the Santa Fe. So look at the same general view on the layout. So this is one of the things I did. I started researching the railroad very early. Um, and I'm talking now about early 70s. Uh, sometime along that point, one of the reasons I picked this railroad was I could not afford all the brass engines that were being released every single month for very popular railroads like SP and Pensy and so forth. And so I wanted a railroad that no one would ever make brass models of. Um, and I needed a lot of photos to be able to build everything. And so there was a book put out by Hank Johnston. Uh, it cost $12, We're now talking 
1970, maybe it was even, uh, maybe 1969 even. Um, I couldn't afford it. My parents bought it for me for my birthday, which was three, four months later. And I thought that was all the photos that existed of this railroad. So I went to a railroad historical society meeting um, up in Oakland. And one person, I think, took pity on me because I was so young. I was in my mid twenties and all these guys that there were as old as I am now. And one guy was a principal at a school and asked what my interest was. And I said, Yosemite Valley Railroad. And he says, well, have you ever met Fred Stowe's? He's got a lot of pictures of the YV. No, he says, well, next time I write him, remember this is before the internet. Next time I write him a letter, I'm gonna tell him that you're gonna get in touch with him. And so he sent me the guy's phone number and, and sent me a letter and said, yeah, you know, he knows it. So I went to see him. Uh, he lived in Santa Cruz, which is about an hour away. And uh, he had 60, over 60 photos of the YV and he was a good photographer. And then he would tell me more people, you should go see this guy, go talk to this guy. So I just kept, I got into it as these hobbyists, these rail fans were still alive. Um, one fellow had passed away, but his widow had all the photos, wrote to her, said, could I come down and, and look at the photos your, your husband took and so forth. So that's how I got close to 4,000 photos. What I also did, I went to the state of California archives. They had the original maps of the entire railroad engineering drawings. So this shows the Merced Yards uh, as it was in the, the, the drawing is dated 1912, but this is what they had. So this is what I built. Um, I have the tracks coming in on the left, have everything but the Y and things are cluttered. When I was working on my railroad, I kept thinking, what if I had a hundred square foot building with no posts holding up the roof and you could model the YV every single mile of it to scale. And then I thought, you know, that would be a pipe dream. I never had that much money, that much time in my life. Couldn't pay enough people to do it. But I finally realized if you had, if you stretch this thing out twice as big and it's only about oh, a third of the size of the prototype, it would take you five or more minutes just to do a run around. Pretty soon you're going, this is really boring. So, um, like I said, I've got all the tracks except for the Y. The Y was used to turn passenger cars, which I don't do. So this is looking at it. Yard area. So I've got, in this area, I've got every single building was there. Uh, I didn't model across the street. You can see why I built, didn't have to build those houses. Uh, but I've got all the railroad buildings that were there in the yard. Uh, even if you look back, there's some trees at the very back next to the roundhouse, and they had an outhouse. It shows up on the liquidation notice. Same thing for El Portel. This is the original drawing of El Portel. Uh, this is not the map that came out of the state of California, because this is a drawing by Nickerson, who was the chief engineer for the railroad. So what I did is I took this drawing reduced it to the same scale that my drawing of my layout is, stuck at about the space I had, cut a pieces out of it. You can see right here, I cut out a, a section of straight track, cut out a piece here, cut out a piece here until it fit the space. So the tracks are exactly what was in that yard. So you, you, you work the yard exactly the way they did. The only difference I had is a, on the left hand end, my tracks curve up instead of down, uh, but otherwise it's the same. So there's my version. You see what's going on here. If you look straight at the yard, that's the yard obviously. Uh, but then I had another wall. And as I mentioned, I mean, this, what you would do is could take the train up to Yosemite. Uh, here's the station. They would put you on a bus and the bus would take this road right here, and that takes you on up to Yosemite National Park. The, the start, the park itself, and there's actually a sign right there from a photo, a historic photo of the sign that says Yosemite National Park, it's over the road. Um, it was probably about seven miles from there to the entrance station. 
but I modeled the entrance station and uh, that stuff just for the heck of it. I had the space. So there's, we're down at ground level looking at that yard. Prototype photo, we're looking east toward Yosemite. On the layout. Another, I'll tell you a quick story on the turntable. Um, I drew the turntable up based on the information I had. Plans were actually in the Narragage uh, Narragage Short Line Gazette published my drawings of that. And then a friend built it. And I never had this worked as operational because they, the railroad rebuilt it in about 22, 1923, somewhere there, and then never used it. They had a Y, um, but they never used that turntable. And so I drew it based on the original information I had. My friend built it and he tried to roll a YV caboose onto it and it didn't fit. What it had done is originally had four stringers. These are the stringers right here. Four stringers on each, or two stringers on each side. They widened it, reinforced it, and put four stringers on each side. I put the additional stringers on the inside. They had to go on the outside. So um, then uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a nonprofit that collected money from, especially from large industrial people, uh, Standard Oil and all these companies. Uh, and what they did is they collected money to give to the park to build projects, take care of things, maintain things. There was another uh, nonprofit, which we were members of and still members of, that if you needed um, 500 people to, to plant trees, they would get you 500 people to volunteer and come up to the park and, and take care of that. So this concrete pit was still there at El Pertel. Um, El Pertel is actually owned by the Park Service now. And a friend of mine that lived in El Pertel uh, knew that the one nonprofit was always searching for stuff to do, you know, spend money on. They, I think we remember that one too. They never said how they split the money up, but 40% of it went for trail maintenance because of the Park Service could not afford to maintain the trails. And then a portion of it went for research, a portion of it went for wildlife habitat. And then there was a little chunk of money went for historical stuff. And that money was spent, the uh, Park Service had a crew doing restoration of buildings and they had restored all the buildings of Wawana and so forth. And my friend that lived here said, Jack, you ought to talk to the park district about rebuilding the turntable. I did, and I said I would draw up plans for it, and they agreed, and then I had to draw up plans and make sure it fit. It had to be right this time, and I corrected my mistakes and so forth. So that turntable has now been built from my plans full size. Structures, this is the station at Merced, the only two-story station. Well, I'll take that back. They had two-story stations out where the station agent lived upstairs and, and uh, was the agent downstairs. Um, I built my first model of this real early back in the, probably the early 70s. And was still, I needed to build the, um, the freight house, which you can see beyond it. I eventually got, well, well that's where I was going. When I built my first model, what I did is I took a picture, I had a picture of a guy standing by the station and I said, okay, that guy's six feet tall. So, you know, there, there, this, this. And then I got a plan for this elevation, front ele the street elevation, showing both the station and the freight house. And so I thought, okay, it's time to build the freight house. I took my print, made a, a copy of it, cut out the freight house, put it up against my building and it was, the building was too big and I could not build the freight house knowingly too big. So um, that's my second second attempt, all scratch build, all sky ring. That was the street side. This is the, the track side view. 
there's a passenger train coming in. This is the roundhouse. Uh, all I had for this was the length, in other words, the length from the front to the back, and nothing else. I didn't know how wide it was, how wide the, the, the each uh, section was, how tall it was. But I had another photo typical of this, but the photographer was dead on. He was looking straight down the tracks. So the tracks were coming right at me. And what did I know? Whoops. Long way. Um, what I knew was the track gauge. And so on that photo, I measured the track gauge, which I knew three feet or four feet, eight and a half inches. Then I made the, measured the spacing between the posts and that came out 16, which seemed right. So if I know that, then I can do everything else. So there's my model, all full size. I'll tell you about the turntable. I scratch built the turntable, but I needed a control system. And this was um, maybe in the 80s, late 80s, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, Andy Sperandio did a, a review of what I think was the very first automated turntable uh, system. Um, no photo cells and so forth. What it, I think it did is it measured the RPM of the motor, how many revolutions the motor had done. So you would program it and you would, it would say, okay, from this track to this track is so much, from this track to this track is so much. So you would dial up, I want track three, and for wherever it is, it would take the shortest direction and go around and line it up. Um, if it was going counterclockwise, it'd overshoot and come back. Beautiful system. Uh, I still have it. So I read that review and it was in a November issue of uh, Model Railroader. And I went in and told my wife, I know what I want for Christmas. Uh, Andy Sperandio just wrote this review on this turntable control system. She didn't ask me who made it, where to buy it, how much it cost, anything. She had met Andy years before. She emailed Andy and said, Jack wants this thing for Christmas, you know, how, where do I buy it and so forth. And so, Andy sent her an email back and said, blah, blah, you know, here's the, the very end. He said, Jack is a lucky boy. Yes. <laughs> when your wife buys you that kind of thing for you, for Christmas, you got it made. There was a liquidation notice ticket made in 1945 when the railroad was being scrapped. They listed every locomotive, the wheel diameters, everything, hoping to sell everything. All the box cars, general dimensions, rock cars, log cars and even some buildings like this oil house. And it's, I don't know how they're supposed to move a brick building that's on a concrete foundation, but it was listed. And this was the very first photo I had come across that showed this building. And I thought, okay, this is all I'm gonna need, all I'm gonna have, but I know the dimensions, 19 by 25. We, I know it's brick. We know it's sitting on a platform that would be a uh, typical boxcar door height type of thing. So I built it and that was in the late seventies. And I thought, you know, this is, this is everything I can see. And so well, it's gotta be right. Well, then years later, I got this photo. Well, this photo shows the other side and what, where I had placed a door was actually windows. And they were windows that you can close to keep fire out. And you can see that from on the track side, there were no windows, no doors. So I built this one. Um, and then it's looking at Sanborn maps. At the very bottom of the map, you can see oil house. That's the building I've been talking about. A friend had got this copy of this. He was gonna build the same building. And he pointed out to me that if you go back, you can see this is the this is the view from the turntable. Bottom is from looking at the turntable. The peak side is on the long dimension. That's not typical. Normally, the peak is on the shortest dimension of a, of a house or whatever. So 
We built the third one. So this is the brick building. Um, came out pretty good. What I did, I didn't, you know, you can buy brick paper, um, but I didn't like what I saw. So I went online and I found a photo of a brick wall, same type of brick. Um, and it was a straight on view. So I took that and photoshopped it and made my own brick paper. So it's basically wood with brick paper on top. So here it is. Now we're looking the other direction. Here's the brick building on the right-hand side. Beyond that is a combine cut in half. It was burned in a fire in 1936. They cut it in half, threw away the bad part and used it for storage. So I built that. And then we go back. You can see there's some, a tank there. I don't know what it was, um, but I think it was kerosene. Um, that makes sense because you've got kerosene lanterns, you got kerosene, you're gonna buy it bulk, you're gonna fill drums so that people can go up and, and refill uh, the lamps with the lanterns on switch, the top of switches, turnout switches, so forth. So I built that. So there's another view. You can see the brick oil house, the combine, so forth. So this is a view of the building that was on the other side, which is a storeroom. Uh, there were also a couple offices in there. But if you think about it, no Amazon, no stores carry what you need. You're running passenger cars, so you need toilet paper. You need this and that. You need bolts, nuts, and so forth. So that's what was kept in that storeroom. Um, and then the water tank and the oil tank. So there's my stores building. It was actually sold and moved and became a scrap dealer. Um, and I went down to measure it and it was closed, but on the other side of it was the Santa Fe tracks on a uh, embankment. So I climbed up there, took photos of it, got permission to come in another time and measured the building and then built, do, drew, drew it up and then built it. This is the uh, water, the oil, well, this is the oil tank. Uh, what they did is they used Bunker C uh, in a processing, oil processing plant. Bunker C is on the bottom, jet fuel comes out the top. Bunker C is the cheapest fuel that you can use, you can burn. It's very thick. If it's cold outside, you have to keep it warm so it'll flow. So what they would do, they would bring a tank car in. If you look at between the tracks, there's a little plate. They would uh, had actually had um, uh, pipes inside the tank car that you could connect to steam to heat up the stuff so it'd flow. They'd dump it down, it would come over into this concrete water or a tank, it's all covered with steel. It had coils in it. They would pump it out of there, put it into the tank. It had coils in it to heat it. The locomotive tenders had coils in them. So um, that's how they did it. So, so this is Santa Fe crossing uh, the cross the uh, SP or the YV is the one going out into the distance. Santa Fe is going across. Uh, this is about a mile from the station. Uh, Lucius Beebe and Lucius Clegg, Charles Clegg, one of, they, they get credit for all the photos they, they took. So I had that photo. I didn't have sizes on it, but I measured and figured out what it was. There's another photo after the tracks were ripped out. So there's my model. Looking at it now, the, the sign on it is too tall, um, but otherwise it's pretty good. But here's a 1940 photo of the building and the color, it's painted dark. It's not painted that yellow with the brown trim. So I talked to uh, probably Richard Henderson because he was a Santa Fe fan and he told me that they had an earlier paint scheme like that. This is, I found this online, restored station, Colorado somewhere. 
But if you take that color photo in Photoshop, you turn it into a black or white, compare it to the station, those are the color of the station. So I built a new one. There it is. There it is in color. There's several buildings I've built more than once. So here's a uh, eastbound local waiting for a signal to drop station in the background. Now I have, I, they had in, on each approach, there were derails and signals. So what the operator would do is he, when a YV was train would come up and stop. And if it was a passenger train, he'd hit, have this, he knew what time it would go by and he would have it set up in advance. But for the locals, they could show up anywhere you know, between four and five or whatever. And so he would set the signals against the SP, then open those derails. And then he would close the derail here and finally drop a signal. So those do work. So an operator, I don't have an operator. So the, uh, the, when I say operator, I'm talking about the, the guy running one of the, my trains on my layout. He has to close that derail. And I tell them it's only about four inches from this track to the edge of the layout. And if you go through that switch when it's in the derail position, when it's open, you will derail that locomotive and it could fall on the floor. So people are really careful about this one, but the uh, signals work, the derails work and the linkage works. Look at the linkage for the, uh, the signal switch. So this was uh, built as far as part of a project in the early 20s to dam up the Merced River. Uh, the YV at this point was follow the river all the way to El Portel. Uh, and that river is coming out of Yosemite National Park. Uh, so, we're, um, so they wanted to build a big dam and dam this up. That required that they pay for and, and get built uh, trying to think of the mile, about 18, 19 miles of YV tracks had to be relocated. And one of the, to get across here, they had to build this 1600 foot long exchequer bridge. So when this was built in the early 20s, it was the longest steel bridge this side of the Mississippi River. It's a massive structure. Uh, these piers are about 240, 200. 230 feet from the ground to the bridge for those concrete piers. Um, so when the railroad was abandoned in 1945, the bridge was left in place. Then in 1966, the irrigation district, Merced Irrigation District, uh, which constructed the original dam, wanted to build a taller dam and very ingenious way of doing it. They built it downstream of the first dam, but pretty close, like 150 feet and used the first dam, which is now gonna be underwater as part of the uh, riprap to protect the second dam. But the feds told them that they had to get rid of that bridge before they could build this taller dam because when the water's down, water skiers couldn't get around and so forth. So um, they had a contractor that was gonna salvage the bridge and uh, sell all the scrap. So here's how I got started. And you'll see where this is going in a couple of minutes. Uh, they took the first section, dropped it when the water's down, pulled it up on the hillside, cut it up and salvaged that. Then what they wanted to do, and these photos came from the people that were in charge of doing this work. I found out who they were and talking back in the seventies, um, their office was maybe an hour and a half from where I live, went up and talked to them, borrowed these photos that they had taken. So what the um, contractor was gonna do then for these other sections is chain flotation devices into a section of it. Hire the company that I was talking to that put explosives around that just, and it, it cut the dam, cut, cut the metal, you know, just instantly. Um, 
And so there goes that first next section. You can see a one flotation device broke loose, but it floated, but they were losing money. It was costing them way too much money to do it. And so they bailed out. So another contractor came in, he's gonna finish it. He's gonna make a lot of money. So, it's, but instead of flotation devices, they were gonna use tank car bodies. And the same contractor uh, that severed the first bridge uh, was gonna be in charge of this one. But, and what he asked them to do is sever one, the far end, and then when everything stopped moving, to cut the other end. Well, the contractor knew exactly how much the, the bridge weighed, but he forgot to add the weight of the tank cars themselves. There it goes, to the bottom of the lake. So then the irrigation district still had to get rid of this piece. They hired the company that had severed the first bridge, told them to go out there and just lay it down in the bottom of the lake. They didn't care anything about it. So it was all set up. Guys were ready to push the plunger down or whatever they did. And here comes some a boat with some water skiers behind it, headed toward the bridge. And the um, official guy said, no, 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 you got to wait for him. The guy says, no, I'm not going to wait. And he, he blows the bridge. Well, of course, the sound takes a little bit while to get to the water skiers. What they see is this massive piece of bridge suddenly slide down into the water. And then they hear the explosion. Um, the water skiers fell off. The guy picked them up, came up here, had a scoop, and all of a sudden, big, huge trout are floating to the surface of the water, killed by the, the implosion. And the guy just scoops up all the, the trout and takes them home. So here's what you see today. During low water, there's that first section that was left there. And there's the tank cars. They just, they were not set up for external pressure. They're for in, internal pressure and they just. <laughs> so what I built is I built one fourth of the, um, the entire bridge. Uh, like a lot of stuff, it was a contest model, which I enjoy. I haven't done it for several years now, but I enjoy entering contests because it pushes me to First, finish something by, before a contest. And second, to make sure that I don't start saying, well, you know, this is good enough for me. Um, this took a long time. I think it was six months to build this bridge. It's all styrene, individual pieces of styrene, no kit pieces. Uh, 3D printing wasn't available in those days. And so I was using styrene one by twos for all the lacing and I, used all of the one by two in the entire Bay Area. No hobby shop had anymore. So I knew the owner of um, um, Evergreen, had met him, I called him up and said, can you, I need 12 packages of one by two. Can you go ahead and put them in the mail? I swear I'll, I'll send you a check. It's no sweat. Um, and I remember at one point I was still working on it. I was sit, sitting inside the house because uh, my shop was outside in the layout room and talking to my wife or watching TV. And she turns to me and says, shouldn't you be working on that bridge? The contest is three weeks from now. All right, I get up and go to work on the bridge. But I was thinking about those uh, photos of that, the bridge after it was blown up till August, 2009. There was an open house. There's a step right here where you step, when you come in, you're at one level and then there's about a, uh, four or five inch step down to the rest of the level. A guy was in talking to my wife and playing with our cat for an hour. He came in and uh, a friend of mine calls him mouth breathers. He walked in and he was in a trance. He kept looking around and he missed the step. Thought if he put his arm out, the bridge would keep him from falling on the floor. It blew that bridge and it was in pieces. Gone. Um, the guy got up. He apologized profusely, went out. And literally, I was worried that I would hear a car door slam and a gunshot. He had, you know, he committed suicide. It wasn't that bad, but he did come back in and, and tell his wife, tell my wife he wanted to give us $100 to toward it. You know, she said, never mind him. But she realized she's a people person. I'm not, that it would make him feel better. 
Um, and it was all over on the internet the next morning. So there was no way I was going to build that same bridge again. This is another steel bridge uh, built as part of that same project to build the dam. This was a um, four section bridge further up. So I built three of those four sections. Bagby Bridge, this is a uh, mile post uh, 45 or something like that. Another view longer away. I've got um, about 100 bridges and buildings on my layout. They're all scratch built, no kits. So this is the Bagby station, built that. And they also had this water tank still in existence, moved but uh, still around. So there's my model of it. Port of Cement Operations, this is where those rock cars were going as empties. Um, and this was a 750 ton uh, storage bin. And you can see on the hillside, there was a third incline. There were two logging inclines and one incline here. Uh, the quarry, if you were to go up about 8,000 feet on the incline, and then go level, oh, in fact, you could see it uh, right there. There's the tracks going out to the, the quarry and they would um, blast out there, load little cars that they had up there. They had a little uh, diesel, ran it over to a crusher. And then they had two cars on the incline. You can see it's double track with a passing track in the middle. One car would go down, one car would go up, same time, up, back and forth, back and forth. Um, So this place was isolated. It did have a bridge to the highway, highways on the other side where the photographer is. Um, they had two boarding houses. If you were married, you were not allowed, you would not be, you would not be hired because there was no provision for women, no provision for a family. Um, there's no, you couldn't work at the store. They, you slept in here and they fed you. So it was, uh, that's all you had. And you probably work six days, I'm sure you work six days a week on Sundays, you can go fishing. So I built one of the two of those. Um, I was, I've been inside this building. Uh, both of those buildings are now gone. The first one was destroyed by a fire maybe 10 or 15 years ago. This one was destroyed by a fire more recently, maybe five years ago. So I've been inside this one. color photo. This is taken pretty late. This is um, 44, just about the time that this company went out of business. Now this is, picture is kind of um, blurry, but this was taken by Al Rose in 1942 with ASA 10 film. If you're old enough to remember film before there was digital, uh, if you want to take action stuff, you're going to use 700, 600 AS, uh, ASA, um, or for more stuff, you know, models you would shoot with 100 ASA. So this is ASA 10, um, taken from the back of a moving train. But I thought he got a really good picture. Um, and this is Red Bud, this is April 42. This is when the Red Bud bloom along the canyon. So there's the same kind of view on my layout. So this is a train, uh, passenger trains uh, turned on a Y that was a couple of miles downstream and then backed into uh, El Portel. And what that did is they've got to turn the whole train around at some time anyway. This got all the cars turned around. The observation and the um, RPO car have to be turned around. And it also put the people at the station, those in the first class section got right off and there's right where the buses were um, and you didn't have to walk the length of the train. Um, you can see standard oil building operation here. The, um, I didn't mention it when I was showing you that uh, those 6,000 gallon Van Dyke tank cars were used partly because of the restriction on how big of a tank car they can have up, up the canyon. But standard oil 
originally owned UTLX. They had to get rid of it, but they still had a, a bond. And so they were still using UTLX tank cars. Uh, Standard Oil had a refinery here in the Bay Area up at Richmond. And so they would load these cars um, up there. There was, you could see a whole bunch of tanks, uh, 55 gallon drums right there. Um, and then there was, an, this guy right here is an oil distributor. All of the gas stations in Yosemite National Park were Chevron, originally Standard Oil, now Chevron. Um, so that's why I'm using UTLX tank cars. So there's three of those, two, or three of the five buildings that were there. This is a nice view of the station and the, the uh, train track at El Portel. This, I don't have a date on it, but um, I'm guessing this was 42, 40, probably 42, 43, somewhere along there, pretty late. There's my model of the, the, uh, the building and the um, train shed. Um, and I actually drew up plans for the train shed. I was a civil engineer, but I had a couple of projects that were be designed by an architectural firm. So I took my drawing and my photos of the train shed and sent them to the lead architect and said, would you ask the structural engineers that are working on my project if they could give me the size of the members on that, and they did. I was I would have had built something that would have fell, fallen down if it was real. So structurally, that train shed is correct. So the station was built in 1907. Um, there is now, actually 1924, the National Park Service adopted a rustic st um, style of architecture for national parks, such as Yosemite and Grand Canyon and and such. And it was really based on this building, which was designed by the YV civil engineer. Uh, I looked at photos of early buildings in the park uh, before 1907, and there was only one, and it was not this exaggerated of a style. It was much simpler. So I think the park district was really influenced by this building in um, how they build these, how they set up the standard for buildings in the public parks. Details, uh, modeling 1939, this is 1937. This is a Dorothea Lang photo. Um, in the late thirties, they were having weather problems in the mid west and also FDR in order to keep food prices or, or yeah, food prices up and the farmers uh, around, he started paying farmers, some farmers to not plant. And what they did is they then bought tractors and were able to take care of all of their acreage by themselves where before they had sharecroppers and a sharecropper would have a little house on the farm. He'd have so many acres of his own that he could grow things on and sell. And that's, that's how, where they made their money to buy food. Um, so a lot of the sharecroppers were coming to California. What was happening was farmers in California, in order to find really cheap labor, sent people back to the Midwest with signs to put up saying, come to California and pick this and this and this. And they had so many people coming to California that um, there was more people than there were jobs. And so those that were here would say, well, I'll pick peaches for $3 a bush. No, I'll do it for $2. I'll do it for a dollar. I'll do it for 50 cents. And the farmers got really cheap labor. Well, that was really a scandal. You know, it was not, it was not illegal, but it wasn't right. And so Dorothy, or a book came out about this in 1937 or 39. And it was about what was going on called Grapes of Wrath. And uh, it was banned in Kern County, which is where I grew up. I didn't know that until my mother told me much later. So what this guy is doing, you can see there's a shadow over on the left. This is how this photo is cropped out. This is not the original photo. The original shows a sheriff over here 
stopping this car and telling this guy, turn around, we don't want you in California, go home. So there's my model uh, based with a lot of those details. There's a rack on the back and, and boards for the, the bed and so forth on top. And they've had another flat tire. That's grandfather on the far side. Um, the father getting ready to change the tire. The mom's on the other side. So more details. If you look on the, uh, the right-hand side, you'll see there's a bunch of wheel sets. And what they did is if you look right here, you can see there's two pieces of rail, two pieces of rail here and so forth. So that let them put all these wheel sets and have them closer together because you weren't going wheel set, you weren't going uh, wheel to wheel. So that was a real simple detail. So I built it in the same spot that shows up in that photo. This is a guy going to work early in the morning. The black and white is a picture looking across the turntable uh, and there's a small building there with the fire hose in it, so I built that. I'm not sure when I got this photo, but I never could figure out what these ladders are doing there. Um, then I realized this building that you see a corner of was the carpenter shop. And so they would do repairs on wooden cars, the box cars, log, the um, stock cars and so forth. And so that was not really ladders, but there was scaffolding so they can get up and, and work on a car. You notice the stuff down here in the, the right-hand corner? I modeled that. You can't use discarded couplers and oversized wheel sets when you do that. These are all scale stuff. This photo um, shows a couple of posts um, right here, one here and one here. And so I modeled those. I didn't know what they were for. Um, and then I got this picture. When that first picture was taken, which was 1946, they'd already demolished this building on the left, or excuse me, on the right, which was the paint shop. And you can see right there is one of the posts that keep the doors from going too far. So that was an easy detail to add. The other one, an L. Rose pitcher, he's got a ride in the caboose. They're leaving, uh, we said. So that was an easy one to do. There's a Velocipede right here. Um, and you can buy little kits for those Velocipedes. So I put it there. Now I own that Velocipede. There was a guy that bought, originally, all I knew was he bought a hand car, a pump car from the YV. He lived in Snelling, which was um, one of those stations on the railroad. And he used to take it to events and be able to pump up and down the track and so forth. And so I got a letter from a guy, oh, 15 years ago now. And he went by that guy's house. The, philosophy, the hand car was still there, a velocity was there. They were not looking, they were not in very good shape. He bought them. He was a woodworker. And so he restored both of them. And he offered me uh, this car or both cars for, I don't know, $2,500 or something. Um, I didn't want the, the pump car, I didn't, didn't have room for it. So I'm a member of a, a railroad close by and uh, they bought both of them. I paid them for this car. What the guy did though, is he built this out of hardwood and not oak, I mean, out of oak and not pine. It is so heavy, you could not get it off of the track by yourself. But more so, he didn't think about having the outrigger to gauge. And so it's not standard gauge, it's not narrow gauge, it's some three feet, eight and a half, 16 inches or something. Um, and then he built an ass backwards. He put the, the outrigger on the wrong side. So I've got to rebuild it one of these days and, and get it repainted. 
Also, I own the one of the station signs from Merced Falls, along with some other bunch of other signs. More details. This is looking into Tunnel One, built as part of that relocation with that long bridge. This is a shot from the, the fan trip. They had a fan trip in '44, another one in '45. This is train coming out of that tunnel, and you notice the little pipe along the track. And so I had to model that. Another photo I got later, and now I see, I just still don't know what the pipe is doing, but there was a rail greaser there. That's the same fan trip, same engine coming out. Oh, and I should mention, see what they did? Engineer was getting tired of run bys. So as he backed up to, on the other side of the tunnel, he turned the, the number board around. So it was upside down in everybody's photos. That's one reason I know this is this photo of that same train. So I had to build the, re, the um, rail greaser. This is up at Bagby. That was where the, the twin water tanks are. Look at the car over here by the, the uh, shed or the garage. So that was an easy detail. This was taken during one of the fan trips. Um, probably the, the same one, I'm not sure. Um, but here's the station over on the left and there's a garage. This is right on Highway 49. There's a highway bridge going across the river. And you can notice there's a uh, Coca -Cola, Coca cup of cola sign here, flying A sign for the gas that we're using. This is the backside of a Highway 49 uh, traffic sign. And then of course the pump. So those were all easy, very easy details. I have a lot of signs on my layout. I have, uh, what I did here is if I needed one 25 mile an hour sign and three stop signs, I just made a whole sheet of them. And so I'd have all of my needs and I could share them. A um, couple of things are interesting. I had read a magazine article, well, an article in that near gauge shortline gazette about Colorado Railroad. And um, it had to be something about midday or mid year, you know, more recent, sometime in the 60s, whatever. Uh, and they had yellow stop signs. And so I made all my stop signs on the layout red or yellow. Well, that was true early on, but in California, in their early 20s, they switched from yellow stop signs to red stop signs. Um, so I was able to have, have the, uh, the Harry 49 sign um, and that's a bear. They don't do that anymore. The signs of today are the same size, same shape and everything, but they don't have the bear because it was the bear republic. Um, so there's one of my stop signs. What's also neat is being able to take a photo of a real stop sign back before they, when they, back early on, is look at the stop signs. Nowadays they have uh, reflective material um, on the stop sign, uh, scotch light, scotch light, that doesn't sound right. Um, but the whole sign is reflective. Those days they didn't have it. And so they actually have reflective buttons to outline the letters. And so that's what this has. Now down here is the logo of the American Automobile Association. And up until the early 60s, the Automobile Association of California was installing tra traffic signs in cities for free all over the state. And when I went to work for uh, the city I live in, Newark, uh, as an engineer in 65, we still had some of these signs with that logo. So even the logo is correct. No one can see it, of course. This is the Fox Creek Bridge uh, up in the canyon. Um, and notice the retaining wall here, all individual pieces of rock. This is an Ansel Adams photo of a different bridge up there but during scrapping. And Hank Johnson, I'd mentioned earlier, was the one that wrote the book, which came out in 63 on the railroad that I thought had every photo. 
uh, he lived up right at the boundary of Yosemite National Park up in the hills or at the mountains though. And he knew everybody in the park and knew Ansel Adams. And when he was writing his book, he called or talked to Ansel Adams and Ansel Adams was famous for his photos of Yosemite. He is a, a, just an unbelievable black and white photographer. And he asked Ansel if he'd ever taken a picture of the railroad. He said, no. Well, after he passed away, his son took over the studio and found that he had taken one picture of the YV. So this is only Ansel Adams' picture of the YV. So there's my retaining wall. What happened is, um, I'm talking about in the 70s, there was a guy, I worked for the city of New York, there was a police officer that was also a model railroad. I don't think he was very good. Um, but he would come over sometimes during his shift to see what I was working on. He was, you know, had his gun and his whole thing. And one time he came over and said that he'd been um, using kitty litter to make retaining walls. Well, I'd never had a cat, so I didn't even know what kitty litter was. And then he, a few months later, he came over and he says, Jack, my cat died, and so here's the rest of my kitty litter. And I looked at it, and that's what I've used. These are individual pieces of kitty litter. Uh, I know we have a cat now, and I. this is the very first kitty litter. They don't make it anymore. Um, but I would tell people, just kidding. I said, you know, I went in and bought some one time, and it turned out it was the wrong, wrong brand, so I couldn't use it. Um, but I said, take a pocket knife, go into the grocery store, make a little cut to make sure it's the litter you need. If it's not, they, oh, there's a leak on the floor here. Um, but those were all, each piece was glued in individually, but it, it came out really well, looked, looked like a nice wall. There were derails. I showed you the derails they had down near um, the Santa Fe crossing. El Portel also had um, derails because uh, an earlier photo, oh, I mentioned the train had turned on the Y and was backing in. Well, the, the tracks are downhill from right to left. That's how the river runs. And so if a car was stored on a track, say right here, and somebody cut the brakes loose and it rolled down, it could run into the back of the, the observation car as it's being pushed up. So the YV had derails on these two sidings, or, or uh, I, they, the, two rail, the two tracks that connected to the main line. So there's one of the signs for one of the derails. Oh, well, I can't see. And it's uh, out of my view over on the, the side there. So I installed both of them. They both work, just like the other ones. And the targets move. You see on the upper left, it's in the safe position, so it's showing it's closed. So the target shows white. Down here, it's showing red because it's open. Now, when we have operating sessions, rarely. Um, there's one fellow, one operator will start building his train in this yard. And it's actually the, the most difficult job because you have to build your track, your train backwards. You have to back out of the yard, caboose first, turn on the Y, and then take off. Um, and the locomotive's already turned for you. And so I always tell them, Tell that operator, be careful because the derails are always in their open position. And I've had a couple operators derail it. Very embarrassing to come ask me to rerail the engine for you. So one of my favorite photos, looking east toward Yosemite National Park. Same equipment, same view. And that's the end. Show you one more slide. Um, I have a website, www. Well, you don't even need that anymore. Certainly. Yeah. Uh, Yosemite Valley RR.com. Um, one of the things I have is a click, uh, a link for um, clinics. And I have handouts for a lot of clinics I've given. On the homepage is a link to a list of all of the videos I've done, except for two of them. Or not that list. One of them. The very first one is my layout. And if you don't want to watch there, I can understand that. But one of them is um, the link for the 
a video done of those logging inclines. And I have color footage taken in 1939 of the top of that incline in operation. That video was released last Thanksgiving, is sitting over 200,000 views, which blows me away because no one else has modeled an incline. Um, but it's a fascinating story just to how they built it and how it operated. There's another one that um, early on, I wrote to the editor of that first, the, the, the uh, author of that first book on the YV and asked him for contact information for all the people whose photos he used because it, it had only been out for maybe 10 years when uh, I bought it and, uh, and he sent it to me. And one of them was a guy named Bob Leno, uh, and he took some neat photos. And I wrote to him and asked him if I could borrow his negatives or whatever. And uh, he said, sure, I'll, I'll put them in the mail to you. Oh, he said, oh, that was in November 2075. And I had my very first major article in a, uh, one of the Model Railroad magazines. It was in RMC, included the cover photo. And it was about a, a cab that I had built of a backhead and all the controls worked. And this guy that had worked on the YV and take these photos saw that issue. And on the back, there was, you know, meet the author and they told about me and so forth. And he said, I read that and you sound like a, a guy I can trust. So I'm mailing you all my negatives. And so I thought, okay, I'll, as soon as they get here, I'll let you know. And so um, they didn't come, they didn't come. So I finally wrote him again and said, you know, I guess I didn't say that up front. I said, as soon as they get here, I'll, I'll let you know. He wrote back and he said, oh, I haven't mailed them yet because I was afraid they'd get lost in the Christmas mail. I'll send them in January. And he did. And so then I started writing him and asking questions. Eventually, he had, he had the, some great stories of when he's working there. He went to work when he was 19 um, and uh, worked there. He wanted to get a job on a railroad out west uh, before he got drafted in January when he turned 20, 40 or uh, 20 years old, and, um, and he did. And uh, so finally, he would tell me these stories. And first thing I started calling him to ask him questions. And he would say, oh, you know, I tell, you know, you tell me another story. So I bought a little recording recorder and a lapel mic, put him in an envelope, sent him to him. And I said, Bob, I want you to, I'm gonna call you on such and such a day. I want you to just clip the, the mic to your, your, call, your, your collar. And um, why don't I get out of this? You can see me instead. Um, stop sharing. There we go. Um, and so uh, I told him, what I want you to do is just tell me these stories and I'm going to record them. And uh, he started off. Oh, and I said, what you've got to remember is people are not going to hear my question. If I say, when did you go to work for the YV? They're not going to hear the question. So what you need to do is say, I went to work for the YV in 19... Yeah. And he got it wired. And so uh, he had a bunch of stories. And so what I finally did a few years ago, this guy that I've been doing YouTube videos with, I said, why don't we take his stories and I'll give you a bunch of prototype photos that you can use to illustrate what he's talking about. And we kind of put him in order talking about uh, when he started working and why he decided he needed a job and, and okay, he, like he didn't have one story which I didn't use. Um, one of them, he, he was a hidden brakeman. So he'd ride in the cab with the conductor or with the fireman and the engineer. And then there was a rear end brakeman who would ride the caboose with a conduct, conductor. Yeah. So one time the engineer says, uh, oh, hit the deck, everybody hit the deck. Everybody hits the deck in the engine. And he says, what's going on? Well, this woman's looking for me because I killed one of her cows last week. So, so that kind of story. And, and he even laughs to himself when he finishes the story. So there is a YouTube video. The link is on my homepage. It's a separate link. And, um, and, what it, um, and they're just, just great stories. And so when I wrote my book on the YV, uh, which is 
Well, it sold out four or five years after it was released. Copies are going, it sold for 65 bucks. There are copies on Amazon for $250. Um, and I've been told, and, and my intent was, people can read this book and understand how a railroad ran, how operations work, how derails work, all this kind of stuff, and apply it to their own railroad, whatever railroad their, fa their favorite railroad is. So uh, I wrote chapter, a chapter on the history, did chapters on each location, each station and so forth, did chapter on the equipment, engines, the cars and so forth. And, uh, and then finished up with a chapter on what happened later, like blowing up that bridge and so forth. And I got to that point, and the last story is about blowing up that big bridge. And I thought, I don't know how to end the book. I mean, you can't, that's not a way to end it. Then I thought about Bob's stories. And so I talked about, I, I literally took exactly the story. My, my wife had transcribed all of his stories. So I, I had them word for word. And, uh, so I talked about, um, he wrote a letter to all the wooden axle railroads in the West asking to get a job. And the YV was the only one that wrote back. And they said, yeah, if you can get out here, uh, I'll get you a job as a wiper. And so he, he was a wiper on the locomotives for about three weeks and they became a brakeman. And um, when he became a brakeman, he was a brakeman on the passenger train. And he said, oh, those guys expected you to be born with experience and it doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, so uh, he was working in New York City in a mail room and he put enough postage on a whole bunch of mail that was going to Manhattan that you could send that, those letters to Bolivia or someplace. And he decided that's when he had to come out here. And so he got the job. And, um, and so then another one of his stories, he's talking about, uh, you know, he wanted to work on this wooden axle railroad out west. And he, he says, so one night we're coming back into the valley and the, the pumps are farting and the moon's out and nighttime. And we get broke up, I, I say this, and I, I'm up in the engine and I lean out and I look at the tender, it says Yosemite Valley. And I knew then I was railroad not west. So that's how I ended my book. And that's how I'm in it, ending this, this talk. So, so, and so if you have questions, fire away.